I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I strongly dislike your behavior, Huxley, the executive vice president said sharply. You must choose, be demoted or leave the company. His words hit me like a truck. I stood there stunned as he continued. This wasn't just any day. It was the day before the final stage of a critical business deal, a deal I had been leading from the start. Out of nowhere, Huxley demanded to take over my role as the lead negotiator. I had no idea where this sudden outburst was coming from. He had never acted this way before. What's the problem here? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. His response made everything clear. This is your fault, he snapped. You're being punished for outperforming me. There it was. Huxley, who was the same age as me, couldn't handle my success. It wasn't about the negotiation or the company. It was personal. He didn't want to see me thrive, especially not in a position he thought he deserved. I couldn't believe it. I had worked hard and poured my energy into this role, and now my superior was trying to take my achievements away. This wasn't the kind of company I wanted to work for. If my hard work only led to jealousy and sabotage, what was the point? I'm done, I said firmly. I'll resign. Tomorrow's negotiation is all yours, executive vice president. With that, I turned and walked out of the conference room, leaving Huxley to deal with the mess he created. The next day, just before the negotiation began, President Rucker, who also happened to be Huxley's father, entered the room. He looked confused. Where's Emery? He asked. He was supposed to handle this negotiation. Huxley, looking smug, responded, I fired him yesterday. Urker's expression changed instantly. His confusion turned into anger as he glared at his son. You what? He demanded. Why did you fire him? Huxley, clearly unprepared for this reaction, tried to defend himself. I thought I could handle it better, he said confidently. But Urker wasn't buying it. Did you even review the negotiation materials? He asked. Panic flickered across Huxley's face as he grabbed the documents and quickly scanned them. His confidence crumbled. He had missed a critical detail, and it showed. His face turned pale. My name is Emery and I'm 38 years old. My career has been an interesting journey. I've changed jobs three times, but not because of layoffs or company closures. My reasons were more personal though I usually told people it was for career growth. It was just easier that way, and most employers accepted this explanation without digging deeper. But during my fourth job interview, something unexpected happened. The vice president, Nixon, saw right through me. That's not the real reason, is it? He asked, looking directly at me. You don't seem like someone who changes jobs just for career advancement, and if that were the case, you'd be aiming higher. Our company and your last one are about the same size, so what's the real story? Caught off guard, I realized honesty was my best option. I shrugged and told him the truth. To my surprise, Nixon listened carefully, nodding as I explained my situation. When I finished, he smiled and said, I get it. I understand why you didn't want to say that up front. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. I left the interview unsure if I had made the right impression. A couple of days later, I got an email that shocked me. They wanted to hire me, not for the supervisory position I had applied for, but as the new sales manager. Confused, I called to clarify. There must be a mistake, I said. I applied for a different role. Nixon laughed. No mistake, he said. Our current sales manager is retiring soon, and with your experience, you're the perfect fit. A manager's job is to lead, not to be led. You understand that, right? His words made sense, and I accepted the offer. When I joined the company, I quickly noticed something unusual. Most of my colleagues were much younger than me, but that didn't bother me. In fact, I found it refreshing. My younger co-workers brought fresh ideas and energy, and they appreciated my open-minded leadership style. However, not everyone was happy. Huxley, the executive vice president, seemed to have a problem with me. 
At first, I wasn't sure why, but it became clear after the previous sales manager retired and I officially stepped into the role. Huxley started nitpicking everything I did. One day, after I submitted a monthly business report to the executive team, Huxley openly criticized me. You should have gotten my approval first, he said loudly during a meeting. The other executives looked confused. My reports had always been thorough and accurate. Feeling frustrated, I asked Huxley, what instructions are you referring to? That's when he lost it. He unleashed a barrage of complaints, accusing me of overstepping my boundaries. It was clear that Huxley didn't like me taking initiative, but instead of focusing on what was best for the company, he made it personal. And that's how we ended up here, with Huxley trying to undermine me just because he couldn't handle my success. You're new to this role. Huxley warned me in a condescending tone. You're like an inexperienced driver. Before making any decisions, check with me or the other executives first. His words stung. Comparing my experience to that of a rookie driver was insulting and far from the truth. I had years of work under my belt, and I was confident in my abilities. As I stood there trying to figure out how to respond, Nixon, the vice president, stepped in to defend me. He skillfully shifted the conversation. Emery's predecessor, the former sales manager, fully endorsed him for this role. Nixon said firmly, the sales staff have also expressed that they find him easier to work with. He's already made a positive impact. Hearing this, the other executives nodded in agreement. They seemed convinced by Nixon's reasoning. However, President Rooker didn't look satisfied. He turned to Huxley, his son, and reprimanded him for his unnecessary outburst. Talented people can't perform well if they're constantly second-guessed, Urker said firmly. Then, looking at me, he added, from now on, the sales department will handle all negotiations directly. Emery seems ready to take on this responsibility. Although I felt relieved by the support, it was clear Huxley wasn't happy about the outcome. His frustration was written all over his face. Over the next few weeks, his anger turned into subtle acts of disruption. Small but significant obstacles started cropping up across the department. At first, it was little things. Samples for negotiations arrived late, promotional materials went missing, or other departments delayed their support. My team and I managed to work around these issues by finding alternatives, like using different samples or creating makeshift solutions. But the problems didn't stop. In fact, they seemed to grow more frequent and deliberate. I couldn't shake the feeling that Huxley was behind all of it. Each department had its own supervisors, but whenever Huxley gave them instructions, like prioritizing other orders or delaying our requests, they followed his lead without question. While I couldn't entirely blame them for following a superior's orders, it would have been helpful if they had at least informed my team in advance. Then something happened that made it clear we were dealing with sabotage. We had reserved a hotel meeting room for an important negotiation, but at the last minute, the reservation was mysteriously canceled. When we called the hotel to find out what happened, they said someone from our company had called and canceled it. I didn't need much time to guess who was responsible. Huxley was the only one with the motive and the means to pull something like this. I knew I had to confront him. Ignoring his behavior would only lead to more problems. Gathering all the evidence, I walked into his office determined to get to the bottom of this. As expected, Huxley played innocent. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, shrugging. It must have been a mistake on your team's end. But his story didn't add up. The sudden cancellation, the limited number of people who knew about the reservation, and the finance department's connection to Huxley all pointed directly to him. With the evidence in front of him, Huxley fell silent. He couldn't come up with a convincing excuse to deny his involvement. Even though I wanted to escalate the issue, I had to focus on the bigger picture. The negotiation was critical for our department and the company's success. Raising a public conflict with Huxley might jeopardize the trust of our clients. Instead, I addressed him firmly. 
This negotiation is too important. Any further interference from you, and I'll have no choice but to escalate this to President Rooker. I have recorded evidence to back me up. Huxley glared at me but didn't respond. For the moment, it seemed like he had backed down. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that he wasn't done, causing trouble. True to my concerns, Huxley made his boldest move yet at the worst possible time. He tried to take control of the negotiation, despite the fact that it was my responsibility. His actions caused chaos and my team had to work harder than ever to keep everything on track. Despite the obstacles Huxley created, I was determined not to let his interference ruin things. This deal was too important to the company and my team. I focused on guiding my team through the challenges, ensuring we stayed professional and effective. Though Huxley had tried to sabotage me, I knew that staying strong and keeping my focus on the job would eventually expose his behavior to everyone, including President Rooker. In the end, people like Huxley can create temporary obstacles, but they can't stop someone determined to succeed. My team and I were ready to face whatever came next, knowing we could overcome any challenge together. We had already overcome several obstacles, like the sudden cancellation of the hotel room, and the negotiation was finally nearing its conclusion. Everything seemed set for the top executives to finalize the contract the next day. But early that morning, Huxley summoned me to his office. His expression was smug as he declared, I cannot trust you with this important negotiation. I will take over from here. You don't need to worry about it. I was confused and taken aback. I don't understand, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. What's wrong? Huxley frowned, his tone dripping with disdain. That's the issue. Why can't you simply follow your boss's instructions? You have a choice, be fired or accept emotion. We don't need you for this job anymore. His words left me speechless. Tomorrow was the final stage of the negotiations, something I had worked tirelessly on from the very beginning. For him to swoop in now and take over was shocking. I hadn't expected such an emotional and aggressive outburst from Huxley. As I stood there trying to process his words, Huxley continued. His expression shifted into something almost gleeful as he sneered. You're being punished for outshining me. There it was. His jealousy lay bare. Huxley, who was the same age as me, couldn't handle my success. He had been quietly sabotaging my work all along. But now that I was on the brink of sealing the deal, he decided to act openly. When I stayed silent, Huxley seemed to enjoy it. He leaned back in his chair with a smug grin and added, You're getting arrogant just because you can speak English, weren't you? Your resume shows you've worked at three different trading companies. But guess what? We have plenty of people here. Who can speak English just as well as you? Huxley sneered as though my language skills were the only thing of value. It wasn't hard to figure out how he had gotten his hands on my resume. After all, the head of HR was under his control. Huxley must have pressured them into showing him my personal details, but his reasoning was absurd. What's your point? I asked, keeping my voice steady despite my growing frustration. Huxley chuckled, clearly amused by his own logic. I can speak English proficiently too, so we don't need your involvement in tomorrow's negotiations. His misconception that my business English skills were the key to the negotiation's success was laughable. He had no idea how much more went into sealing a deal of this magnitude. Still, I didn't feel the need to correct him. If he wanted to take over, so be it. I had no desire to stay in a company where hard work and accomplishments were overshadowed by petty jealousy and savage. I'm done, I said firmly. I have no attachment to a company where my superiors take credit for my efforts. Tomorrow's negotiation is all yours, EVP. Without waiting for a response, I turned and walked out of the conference room, fuming. I headed to the sales department to pack my belongings, determined to leave this toxic environment behind. On my way out, I ran into Nixon. He immediately noticed something was wrong. You look upset, he said, concerned. 
What happened? Nixon invited me to his office, and I decided to tell him everything. I recounted all of Huxley's actions, from his repeated sabotage to his latest attempt to take over the negotiations. I even mentioned previous incidents, like the cancelled hotel reservation. As I spoke, Nixon listened intently, his face growing more serious with every detail. When I finished, he closed his eyes and seemed lost in thought for a moment. I braced myself for him to downplay my concerns, but when he finally spoke, his tone was heavy with frustration. Huxley has done it again. Again, I asked, confused. Nixon didn't give me a direct answer. Instead, he asked, did you notice anything unusual in the executive meetings? I thought about it for a moment. Well, except for me, there weren't any other people around my age in those meetings, I said. At first, I thought it was because those roles are usually held by older individuals, but now that I think about it, even for a mid-sized trading company, it's strange. Surely there are capable younger employees who should be part of those discussions. Nixon nodded slowly, his expression grim. Exactly. Huxley has a habit of keeping younger, talented people away from those meetings. Let me explain why. According to Nixon, Huxley had joined the company about five years ago after his previous employer went out of business. It was merit that had brought him here, but it was a favor from the president's ex-wife that insisted Huxley be given a role. The president had reluctantly brought him on board. Since then, Huxley had been using his position to solidify his power. Now that the president has remarried, Huxley knows his position is even more precarious, Nixon explained. He feels threatened by younger, more skilled employees, which is why he's been systematically keeping them out of leadership roles. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So that's why he's been targeting me? Nixon gave a bitter smile. It's not just you. Huxley came from an entirely different industry and has no real expertise in trading. His youthful appearance is his only advantage. People often underestimate his age. Before you joined, he made sure no one who could challenge him got too close to power. Hearing this made everything click. Huxley's actions weren't just about me. They were part of a larger pattern of insecurity and manipulation. It explained why he had gone to such lengths to sabotage me. But it also made me realize something important. His fear of being outshined wasn't my problem, it was his. Nixon, I appreciate you telling me this, I said, standing up. But I can't stay in a company where this kind of behavior is allowed to continue. Nixon nodded, understanding my decision. I'll take this up with the president. Huxley won't get away with this forever. As I left Nixon's office, I felt a mix of frustration and relief. Frustration that I had to leave behind a job I had worked so hard for, but relief that I wouldn't have to deal with Huxley's toxic behavior anymore. My focus now was on moving forward and finding a place where my efforts would be valued. Huxley had a habit of making bold claims about appealing to younger employees, but he never provided any real evidence to back up his statements. Yet the seasoned executives listened, assuming he knew what he was talking about. Over time, it became clear that having peers of his age or younger around him threatened his position. Instead of improving his skills or earning qualifications through training, Huxley chose the easier route eliminating his rivals. He believed that by removing others, his opinions would carry more weight and he would face less competition. Employees in their late twenties to mid-thirties, particularly those in supervisory roles, became his main targets. Any noticeable behavior or success on their part was met with harassment, false accusations, or other tactics to force them out. Those who valued their peace and careers often resigned to escape the hostile work environment. This left the company with only two types of employees, the older, well-established president and fresh-faced younger staff who were just starting their careers. Now I understood Huxley's behavior more clearly. He wasn't just a toxic colleague, he was a manipulative office bully. 
His primary goal was to maintain his image as the youngest, most capable executive in the room, even if it meant undermining others. His underhanded tactics often went unnoticed by the president and other high-ups, only becoming apparent when the victims were on the verge of leaving. I had mentioned Huxley's behavior to the company president once, but he dismissed my concerns. He couldn't believe his own son would act so petty and jealous. To him, it was unthinkable. After all, the president had built the company from the ground up, transforming it into a fierce competitor in the industry. He couldn't comprehend how someone like Huxley could prioritize appearing young and important over genuine confidence, but I knew better. I had seen firsthand what happens when such behavior is left unchecked at one of my previous jobs. Jealousy and sabotage had gone unnoticed until it was too late, and the company collapsed. I decided it was time to confront Nixon directly. Executive Vice President Nixon, I began, what are your goals for this company? Nixon looked puzzled by my sudden question. My goals? Well, I hope we can keep increasing our revenue and profits. The president's successor is also very capable, even though he's still a student, he replied. His tone suggested that he hoped I would overlook Huxley's actions and avoid stirring up trouble. Nixon had been with the company for a long time, and it was clear he valued stability over conflict. But I couldn't let the issue slide. Taking a deep breath, I revealed something I hadn't mentioned to anyone before, not even during my job interview. Do you know why I've changed jobs three times? Nixon nodded. Yes, you mentioned being forced out due to jealousy. Well, that's unfortunate. We're lucky to have gained someone as talented as you. I shook my head. That's only part of the story, I said. The reality is that those three companies no longer exist. They've either split, dissolved, or gone bankrupt. They don't operate anymore. Nixon's expression shifted from calm to shocked. That can't be true, he said. When we did a background check, those companies were thriving. If you believe me, I suggested, I encourage you to check their websites now. Nixon pulled out his smartphone and began searching. With each passing moment, his face grew more and more alarmed. You're absolutely right, he said quietly, but how could this have happened? It's simple, I explained. The people who drove me out became more confident and started repeating their actions with others. When a cycle like that continues, it destroys a company from the inside. A business cannot function without its people. If employees lose trust and start leaving, the company will eventually collapse. Nixon's expression grew serious as he absorbed my words. I continued, if this situation with Huxley isn't addressed, this company could face the same fate. Huxley's harassment may seem minor compared to what I've experienced in the past, but it's becoming a significant problem. He's already pushed me to choose between being demoted or losing my job. If I resign, it will only encourage him to repeat this behavior with others. After a long silence, Nixon finally nodded firmly. I understand your perspective now, he said. This isn't just workplace drama. Sabotaging the company out of jealousy is a serious issue, and I won't stand by and let it continue. I felt a wave of relief. With Nixon on my side, there was finally hope for change. After consulting with him about the next steps, I headed to HR to retrieve the resignation paperwork I had prepared earlier. Just as I was leaving, President Rooker appeared, looking puzzled. What's going on? He asked. Huxley, standing proudly beside him, declared, I've already taken care of the negotiation. Emery won't be involved. What do you mean? Arker asked, narrowing his eyes, Emery was supposed to handle this. Why isn't he involved? I fired him yesterday, Huxley said with a smug smile. It's fine. I can handle it. I can speak English and all that's left is signing the contract. Parker's expression turned icy. Did you even review the negotiation documents? He asked sharply. The executives from the other company are arriving today. How do you plan to manage this without Emery? Huxley, who had assumed the negotiation was just a formality, 
suddenly panicked. He grabbed at the documents and began flipping through them frantically. His face turned pale when he found a critical detail he had overlooked. The contract wasn't written in English. It was in Arabic, the official language of the Middle Eastern company we were dealing with. An hour before the negotiation, I received a desperate call from Huxley. Emery, we need you at the hotel right now, he pleaded. I chuckled softly. Huxley, this is very different from what you said yesterday. Didn't you claim you didn't need me? I didn't realize the contract was in Arabic, he stammered, his voice shaky. Well, I replied, if you had read the documents earlier, you would have known that. I hung up the phone, leaving him to deal with the mess he had created. Some lessons, I thought, are learned the hard way. Many people couldn't overcome the challenges in our negotiation process, but I had a unique advantage. My ability to negotiate fluently in Arabic set me apart. Speaking seven languages was one of my strengths, and making a joke in Arabic to lighten the mood was as easy as breathing. If the negotiations shifted to Arabic and the top executives, who trusted us to be reliable, were only addressed in English, it would be a disaster. They would feel insulted, and the deal would fall apart. The documents clearly stated all requirements, and Huxley's claim of ignorance wasn't an excuse. His desperation was obvious when he started accusing me of fraud, claiming I had hidden my skills by not listing all of them on my resume. I couldn't help but laugh. Fraudulent hiring? Seriously, I replied, not listing every qualification isn't fraud. Besides, I never claimed I could only speak English. Huxley's tone turned resentful. If I had that skill, I'd brag about it, he said bitterly. That's the difference between us, I responded calmly. I don't need to boast about my abilities. There was no time to dwell on Huxley's jealousy. The negotiation was critical, and I knew the deal would fall apart if things continued as they were. Huxley, clearly out of his depth, started growling in frustration. His anger boiled over as he threatened to step down and tell his father, the company president, seeing an opportunity. I encouraged him. Why don't you call your father now, put him on speaker, and explain why you tried to remove me from the negotiation? Huxley hesitated but eventually did as I suggested. The moment he started speaking, I knew I had won. His desperation was evident, and I could already see the outcome. By the time I arrived at the hotel, ten minutes late, the deal was mine to save. Amusingly, Huxley had memorized an Arabic phrase, Amory will be here soon, and kept repeating it to stall for time. Nixon had anticipated this situation and had booked me a room on another floor, advising me to arrive slightly late to teach Huxley a lesson. When I joined the negotiation, I used humor to break the tension, joking about the cultural differences in time management between Arabs and Americans, which helped the conversation flow smoothly. Once the mood lightened, the contract was practically signed. As I saw off our guests, I let out a deep breath, relieved, the deal was a success and the company was secure. Huxley, who had been sitting frozen in the corner, slumped into a chair, exhausted from the stress. President Rooker thanked me for stepping in and apologized for Huxley's behavior. We'll be taking disciplinary action against him, Rooker said firmly. Huxley remained silent under his father's glare. Back at the office, Rooker made good on his word. I took you in when you had nowhere else to go, and this is how you repay me. He scolded Huxley in front of the executive team. It's like being bitten by my own dog. Write your resignation letter today. You can stay until you find another job, but if you refuse, you'll be fired. You had no problem giving Emery the same choice. Huxley, trembling under the weight of his father's anger, quickly agreed to resign. I struggled to keep a straight face as he rushed to HR, where his resignation was processed immediately. The next week, during the morning meeting, Urker addressed the entire team. He detailed Huxley's misconduct and warned that anyone who had aided him in his sabotage would face consequences. 
employees who had reluctantly followed Huxley's orders were either transferred to lower roles or resigned under scrutiny. The company also adjusted its hiring practices, bringing in more experienced employees in their 25s and 35s. This positive shift allowed younger staff, who had previously felt stifled, to thrive. Removing Huxley from the equation revitalized the company. However, Huxley himself struggled to find another job, facing the long-term consequences of his actions. Later, Rucker asked me something that had been on his mind. Why didn't you highlight your ability to speak seven languages on your resume? It's such a valuable skill. I smiled and explained, for me it hasn't always been a benefit, it's been more of a hindrance. When I was younger, I was passionate about languages and became fluent in seven by the time I graduated college. My first job involved using the skill, but it ended up limiting my opportunities. I was confined to interpretation and translation tasks, even when I wanted to take on more active roles in negotiation. Despite knowing how to improve deals, I wasn't allowed to voice my opinions. When I asked for a transfer to a more involved role, my superior dismissed me, saying an interpreter only needs a functioning mouth, not intelligence. My co-workers misunderstood my role and resented me, thinking I was receiving special treatment. Frustrated, I left. I continued this pattern at my next two jobs. My language skills made me valuable, but they also drew jealousy and resentment. By the time I reached this company, I decided to downplay my linguistic abilities during the interview process. It was Nixon who saw through me and realized my potential. Parker nodded, reflecting on my story. I see now why it was so important to address Huxley's actions. Thank you for sticking with us and helping uncover these issues. With Huxley gone, the company thrived. Rur kept his promise to repay my efforts. The following year, he advanced to the role of chairman, and Nixon became the new president. I was also promoted, moving from sales manager to executive vice president. Despite the promotion, I remained involved in managing the sales department, ensuring our team stayed strong and innovative. Now, my focus is on developing reliable subordinates and creating an environment where diverse talents can grow. I use my linguistic skills not just for convenience but to build bridges across cultures and expand our reach. I firmly believe that those in leadership positions have a responsibility to nurture talent and I apply this principle in my daily work.